Good afternoon. Um, Scott Guthrie this morning in his keynote says, data is the power that fuels AI. This talk is gonna be about how we protect and secure your data. Usual disclaimer here. I'm super excited to be here. My name is Arun Gupta. This is my first build ever. I've spoken at all developer events all across. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've spoken at all sorts of developer events all over the world, you know, almost 50 plus countries, but I'm super excited to be here. Um, I run the open ecosystem team at Intel, and as part of that, my team helps define the open source strategy across Intel, and we work with um, all the different business units. Hi folks, I'm Graham Beery. I work on the Azure Compute team, specifically with Azure Confidential Computing. This isn't my first build. I've, I've definitely been at build before, um, but it has been, I think, about five years since doing this in person. Uh, I feel like I've aged looking at my picture since, since the last time I was here. But uh, I'm definitely excited to be here and be able to see folks in person again. So uh, welcome to build for the folks in person here, as well as all of those watching online. Let's take a look. You know, when developers are building application today, what are they missing? This is a typical application developer stack. When you build an application, you look at it down at the bottom to silicon level, all the way to services and solutions that you're offering to your customers and everything in between. You have operating systems, you have languages, you have libraries, middle work, framework, application, microservices, you look at that as your typical application developer concern. You are familiar with it. Now, as we said, data is really fundamental to all of this. How is the data flowing across the different layers? How can we protect that data? How can we make sure what are the things that we're gonna enable if the data is secure and private? What if I were to bring an exponential large data available to my application? So that's the developer concern that I believe we are missing. And it's not that the data is not available. Is the data is available, but the privacy and security standards and the regulation restrict access to the data of how much it is available. And particularly after Scott this morning said, data is the power that fuels AI, how would to enable AI? You know, how it could be used securely with high confidence that I'm truly building the application, leveraging the data. Well, and now that we're in this era of AI, it isn't just the data. This is where we're getting into the models, the model weights, the, the components that go into your AI solutions. Many conversations that I've had lately are equally wondering how to protect the IP of these models and the, the trained weights behind them. It gets more complex when we get into conversations about who you're trying to protect from, whether it's the data or the models, is it the, the cloud provider just to meet regulations? Is it the model developer? Because equally regulations can't allow that data to be exposed to the model developer. So we get into all of these AI specific problems that never existed when we were trying to figure out how to just protect data. And this is going to constantly evolve as we look at it, you know, because this is still a new field very early in the days. Now, an important element, particularly when we are looking at AI, is not just the volume of data, but also the diversity of data. And the diversity of data, what it means is, I wanna have data from all different continents, all different geographies, and they might have their own jurisdictions. They might have you know, the ability by which they can share the data or may not be able to share the data. Because that's what makes your model that much more real. Access to a real world data is so much critical to improve the accuracy of your model. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And many solutions that we're seeing are originally trained and developed with synthetic data. And this is where there's sometimes a concern that you might not have a highly performant model when it's just based on synthetic data, especially in cases where people's lives could be at stake. Uh, this is like healthcare with clinical AI and, uh, and really trying to understand if the right data was used to train some of these models. It's, it's, I always think about the example with uh, autonomous cars, right? W would you be okay driving in an autonomous vehicle that's only been trained on synthetic data, not actually having real world road conditions built into that model and the AI that is powering that car? 
um, I definitely would have concerns. So there's an opportunity that we can improve the data sets that are made available for actually generating these AI models. Any, th any thoughts there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've seen those autonomous cars driving around the city. It still freaks me out knowing that car has been trained on a real world data, but imagine the same car that is thrown. Talk about diversity. Imagine the train, the car that is trained on San Francisco data is deployed in a different city, in a different country. I don't think I'm gonna go no. in that car. It, the relevance of the model is so much more important that way. So let's talk about what is Microsoft and Intel doing together to make this better for you. Um, something that we are super proud of, it's been a very long relationship between Microsoft and Intel that we have been working together. And so let's talk about the areas like confidential computing that really allows you to improve the security and the privacy of that data. So let's think in terms of what is Intel's vision for AI? We always believe in democratizing AI. What that means is making AI available and accessible to everybody. And we really look at, at the bottom of the layer. You know, we have a very rich portfolio of, portfolio of hardware, you know, from CPUs to GPUs to XPUs to FPGAs. How you wanna build the application is a commodity hardware, it's available in a CSP, it's available in your data center, it's available in the client, it's available on the edge. How you wanna leverage this is purely up to you. On top of that, we have libraries and software optimizations. Are you using uh, PyTorch? Are you using TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, Onyx? Pick a framework of your choice. That's the reason Intel contributes to 300 plus open source projects because our customers who consume silicon, that's how they consume it. So there are hundreds and thousands of engineers at Intel that contribute to these open source projects so that they stay fully optimized and leverage the best features of the silicon. Well, sometimes PyTorch is good, but oftentimes you need something built on top of that. Create me a reference architecture that I can compose with PyTorch and other toolkits to get it going. And that's where we launch um, toolkits and blueprints that makes it easy for you to get started. There are about 35 toolkits that we are working on. Several of them have already been released. That makes it very easy to get you started. And last but not the least, really think of it in terms of a service model. And that's where AI solutions come out. So we launched Intel Getty, you know, which was a service that we launched last year at Intel Innovation in September of 2022, which basically allows you to create a simple computer vision model in a very easy manner. So really, Think in terms of how data is critical across all of these and providing constant insights because that's what makes your model and your AI processes more effective. That's one of the things I actually have, have been inspired working in this partnership with Intel, with, with yourself, in that years ago I always thought Intel was just a hardware company. And my, my mindset shifted to once I started realizing, hey, it's all about the end-to-end -end solution and how much Intel was actually involved in these open ecosystems with all of these components above running above the hardware. So very, very cool to see. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I've always been a software guy in my entire life. So when our CTO, Greg Lavender, reached out to me last year, Arun, I want you to build an open ecosystems team. Like, Intel and software, what do you do here? And here we are. And I, I call myself as a chief storytelling officer, yeah. telling that story why Intel is relevant in the software space. We have been contributing to software for over 20 years. Intel is the top corporate contributor to Linux kernel for 15 years. We are among the top contributors to Kubernetes, OpenJDK, PyTorch, you pick an open source framework. And we have been contributing them very actively just to make sure out of the box, wherever you're running, those platforms are optimized for you. Now let's talk about confidential computing because this equally plays into that open source and, and global community type ecosystem. Uh, so confidential computing is uh, a, a term that was manifested several years ago uh, out of Microsoft. And then it was an initiative that no one company could do alone. So Intel and Microsoft partnered together to start up the confidential computing consortium. This is where Multiple organizations, you can see here just a subset of them, cloud providers, hardware vendors, solution providers, all come together to figure out the standards, both for terminology as well as technology that we want to uh, 
consider that confidential computing is a standard for the industry. And, and this isn't just running in the cloud. It's the cloud, the edge, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and also focusing on education around regulation and how to really protect data in use. I think what I love about Confidential Computing Consortium is, first of all, it belongs to Linux Foundation. So it's a third party nonprofit foundation, open source foundation. Second is unprecedented variety of organizations yeah. that were thinking about the problem but never able to put the pieces together. And then the third part that I really like about this part is it really broadens the volume and diversity of data. As you mentioned, no matter which you're running, which cloud, which data center you're running at, that thing is available to you out of the box because it is open source. So what is confidential computing? To get into the specifics, this is what the definition is from the Confidential Computing Consortium. It's specifically the protection of data in use by running in a hardware-based and attested trusted execution environment. It comes with some of these assurances around uh, making sure you can only run authorized code on your data. That's that step of attestation that we can dive into. And it's not just down at the hardware layer, it, it goes through the layers so that you as developers can build in that trust within your applications so that you know you're running in one of these trusted execution environments with memory encryption, with keys that are bound into the hardware. And, and this is the type of environment that we believe is the future for protecting data while it's processing. So while we think in terms of data that at rest and in transit, what it's adding is the in-use aspect as well. While the data is in the memory, for example, how do you protect it? So that's the crit critical element here. Yep. Now, confidential computing and open source goes hand in hand because you know, it really demands that transparency, it really demands you know, how the full stack runs, especially in the cloud, because that's where all the developers are getting started. So because of the unprecedented amount of organizations that are running together to make this successful and open source elements, it really goes very well with the entire philosophy. Yep, exactly. And you mentioned there the data at rest and in transit. Those are solutions that we already have in the cloud. These have existed for years, uh, being able to encrypt data uh, when it's in storage or TLS encryption on the network. While data is in use, was always that gap. It was it needed to be unlocked for processing within your applications. Well, now we have this new innovative hardware that we're actively deploying in Azure. Um, Intel has been a partner with us. We've had this type of hardware available in Azure for several years now. And that means you can have security at runtime while your applications are processing on data. And I mentioned before, those hardware encryption keys are actually baked into the CPU. So no one from Azure has access to any of these memory encryption keys. As well, you can bring your own customer managed keys to unlock the data while it's processing. So you bring in your data into this secure environment, you verify, you run that attestation, and then you get to make sure it's, it's a valid environment that you expect in this hardware protected state before you unlock your data. So it's, it's really going to revolutionize computing, uh, especially in the cloud, for what you can go and bring to the cloud in terms of sensitive data uh, that's today potentially kept on-prem and regulated. We really do have a high bar in Azure building on top of that standard set by the, the Confidential Computing Consortium as to how we look at protecting data while it's in use in Azure. And the benefit to the customer is because we are working in an open ecosystem, you know, it's not just dependent upon a cloud-specific solution. There is no lock in here. You know, if you are operating it using confidential computing protocols in Azure, you could just extend that to multiple clouds as well. You can even bring your own hardware and set up the attestation mechanisms right there itself. Okay, so we talked about the background with confidential computing. I know you have lots of fun stuff going on with um, the, the utilities that Intel is building on. Talk to me about what's available today for developers. Well, that's what developers care about, right? You know, show me all this vision, which is great, but what can I do today? Let's look into it. Federated learning is one way by which confidential computing is being put to use. You really want to build your machine learning models, do that in a secure manner. You want to make sure that you, know, you have access to the data across multiple geographies, honoring their jurisdictions. So what is federated learning? Well, if you think about centralized learning, all the data comes in to a single place. That's when you train the model, you keep training it until you get the relevant accuracy. 
But with federated learning, what we are doing is, instead of bringing data to the model, we are taking the model to the data. And so what essentially is happening is there is a aggregator, and then there are collaborators. So essentially, collaborators are the one where the data is sitting, and aggregator is the one that is sending the model to them. They train the model locally, they send the model back, and then the aggregator combines all the data model and then sends the updated model back. This cycle of combining the model, sending it back to collaborator and back to aggregator happens until you reach the desired level of accuracy. So that's the beauty of it. You know, so you don't have to share the data. Your data stays in your jurisdiction, in your regime. But that's where the confidential computing plays a very important role on how it enables that end-to-end -end kind of a pipeline. Yeah, so in this case, you're going to have confidential computing both in the cloud and on the edge. So again, like we talked about model protection, that can be the models are protected in your on-premise environment, as well as the, the models and the data, can, everything can be protected while it's running in the cloud when doing that aggregation. Correct. Uh, model and data both are equally important. So in this case, both are protected well, leveraging that secure um, confidential computing. So one of the use cases is uh, where uh, is a case study with NASA. When, when you look at space, you know astronauts are up there. The cosmic radiation can penetrate through steel and aluminum, and the rays can actually hit your skin. And there is a possible danger effect that it could cause cancer to you. So this is a case study that we did, you know, um, with um, federal a federated development lab, which is a joint venture between Department of Energy and NASA. Now, there is very little data available for the astronauts and very, very protected. So that's where you know, OpenFL kind of came in very handy. So the idea here was, let's create a model. That model could then be sent to the places where the astronaut data is available. You identify you know, what the model is, then the model comes back to the aggregator, and it goes back and forth a couple of times. Well, a few times probably. Uh, but really, you are able to partner all of those multiple institutions together so that then you can collectively creating a model. And as a matter of fact, what we saw is as we were doing this exercise with the FDL, the model accuracy went up by 20%, 27%, as opposed to just doing it on their own silo. Very cool. Let's take a look at another use case for OpenFL. <clears throat> now, this is a joint case study with UPenn and many other partners. Now, this is the largest federation of healthcare institutions to gain knowledge for tumor boundary detection. It is such a global problem, we really need that global participation to make this happen. Initially, this started with only three states in the US, California, Massachusetts, and New York. That's where the model was built, but now, this model has to be deployed in a global scale. If this model were to be deployed in rural village in India, it's not going to work. And that's where you, know, you can see this. We have 70 fun, 71 sites across six continents. They cannot share the data. They have their own jurisdiction requirements, control, and it's very sensitive data, HIPAA, whatever, right? So they cannot share the data. So that's where the model was sent to them, and we got the results back. And it greatly increased not just the volume, but the diversity of data. So again, a very classic use case. Like in the NASA case, it was a bandwidth issue. But here in this case, it's truly the jurisdiction issue as well. So different ways by which OpenFL can be applied to make this successful. This is awesome. I love these use cases. Um, I feel like the, the folks here could get value into diving in how some of it works. Because I know we, we want to make this connection with OpenFL and confidential computing. So um, in this regard, OpenFL is actually using already built in some of the primitives with confidential computing. I just learned this recently, actually, that uh, the, all of the governance that is built in with OpenFL leverages what underneath the hood is called uh, the Confidential Consortium Framework. This was manifested from Microsoft Research years ago when we started deploying our, our Intel SGX infrastructure. Uh, so OpenFL uses that governance with this distributed trust framework to be able to give 
uh, management to the participants and the applications. There's integrity within the applications that are run within the open FL framework, and it verifies the apps and enforces the plan and the experimentation that's done with that OpenFL solution. Uh, this is, by nature, open source. Again, that same theory that confidential computing primitives are, are ideal to be audited and, and seen in the open. So this is a naturally an open source framework that does give that decentralized trust and governance built in with that framework. And it builds consensus based on granular confidentiality, uh, again, running in that Intel SGX confidential computing cloud environment. Intel SGX, you mentioned. So let me talk about what Intel <laughs> SGX is. Now, Intel SGX is Intel Software Guard extensions. You know, SGX really helps you protect data in use via application isolation technology. Really, what you're doing is you're creating secure enclaves by which, which are completely encrypted. So the application is directly talking to the CPU to encrypt and decrypt the data and bypassing the layers in between. The data and the code originating in the enclave is decrypted on the fly within the CPU protecting them from being examined or used by other code at all. Because in some cases, even the operating system or the hypervisor could be malicious code. So it allows you to protect it from that part of the data. And this is what is available on the Intel architecture today. Yeah, and in Azure, because we've had the SGX machines in Azure for the last few years, I've seen lots of different customers and partners bring their workloads to Azure and leverage uh, SGX. These have been a lot of the specialized workloads used for uh, cryptocurrencies or secure key management, um, any digital assets in the financial space where it's highly, highly critical to have lots of uh, security around the data, especially when transferring um, uh, major digital assets between companies. And of course, leveraging some of these frameworks like we talk, talked about with uh, CCF, the Confidential Consortium Framework, in order to make sure there's that tamper-proof ledger. We actually built a couple of services in Azure that leverage that open source framework, the Azure uh, Confidential Ledger for, for, build, for uh, enabling tamper-proof audit logs, as well as our SQL Ledger in, uh, in secure enclaves, being able to leverage that same Intel SGX uh, audit trail within our SQL Ledgers. With Intel SGX, you know, you download, you know, you get started with the architecture, you have to write application code to enable SGX to exactly to the line by which you want to encrypt or protect, essentially. Well, that's where Grameen kicks in. You know, it really requires a little bit more sophisticated engineering, but Grameen, I say, would, is the way by which you easily commoditize SGX. Now, developers don't need to be very skilled or if for effective partitioning or code modification for Intel SGX environment, which it requires if you were to leverage the capabilities of SGX. Grameen is an open source library, part of, again, the Confidential Computing Consortium um, that makes it very easy for you to use SGX. So essentially, as you see on the left side, you get your application, unmodified application, you wrap it up in a Docker container, and the Grameen library is bundled along with it, and that's what exactly is giving you all the capabilities that you would expect from SGX. And developers can provide an optional manifest Grameen would automatically create it for you, but otherwise you can provide an um, optional manifest file to configure the application environment, isolation policies, and Grameen automatically does the rest. Um, Intel has pre-optimized many of the most popular open source frameworks, as you can see on the right side, and many of these are actually available now in the Azure marketplace. And talk about the maturity of Grameen. Grameen is the first project from confidential computing that has gone from Incubation, sandbox to incubation, which is like these are stages of projects in the Confidential Computing Consortium, but it has gone back, gone from sandbox to incubation, and the requirement in order to graduate from one to the other state is you need to have the diversity of contributors, the uh, production use cases, just shows the maturity of Grameen. Yeah, and uh, plus I've seen many of our partners that we work with in Azure uh, onboard and create solutions that are available in the Azure marketplace that are fundamentally built on Grameen and, and similar frameworks. So uh, lots of good traction in the ecosystem with some of these uh, ISV solutions. So customers can choose either SGX at the ground level, they could choose Grameen at a level above that if that's what they're comfortable with, or the ISVs that you're talking lots about. Lots of solutions, yep. 
Um, one of the examples that I just I just love talking to it's the the beekeeper AI and just this last week they announced their escrow AI, escrow AI offering in the Azure marketplace. This is a, a a partner I love working with because of the meaningful change that they're bringing with AI into healthcare. This is. Uh, an example where what we talked about before, how do we bring regulated data, this PHI, uh, health records, with real world health records to model developers that are trying to build revolutionary models in healthcare to be able to make meaningful impact for clinicians. To, and ultimately, uh, the, the goal here is to reduce the time and improve the, the outcomes for healthcare, ultimately saving people's lives. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, uh, but talking with them, they were able to r reduce the time it took to get AI from inception into, uh, into clinicians' hands by uh, months, if not years, as well as just getting access to that data for that model developer uh, from multiple years down to just a few months in order to be able to train the models with real-world patient data in a secure and, and regulatory compliant way. So just truly revolutionary to see the types of solutions that we're seeing built on some of this grounding infrastructure. Again, building that innovative AI in a privacy protective way. I, the fact that I love about this part is, you know, we could create any fancy technology, but when it starts to change the world, when it starts to make the world a little bit better one at a time, I think that's when it becomes a lot more humbling that, you know what? Is something a lot more meaningful. It's, it's very, very cool, yeah. So, we talked about some things that are already being done. Can we get some inspiration to what's coming next? Let's take a look. Now, we talked about SGX, we talked about Grameen, we talked about ISV, multiple ways by which you can operate upon it. Let's talk about Intel um, Trust Domain Extensions, or TDX as we call it as. Now, it introduces a new architectural element to help deploy hardware isolated virtual machines called as trust domains. Unlike SGX, it is a virtualization based confidential computing environment. With TDX, the entire virtual machine is isolated in a confidential computing environment. SGX is great where you have to kind of architect your application, engineer your application, use it Grameen library. TDX is excellent for a lift and shift kind of environment. You know, you can really isolate the VM from VMM, hypervisor, and any other non-technical, non-trusted domain software on the platform to protect trusted domain from a broad range of software attack. Even the operating system that is privileged in other environments could be considered malicious and you can define those boundaries. So this really helps assure workload integrity and confidentiality by mitigating a wide range of software and hardware attacks including intrusion or inspection by software running in other VMs. Yeah, and for me, this is where customer diversity and flexibility and, and just options come into play. If you want to have really fine granularity and go down to lines of code, you have that option with SGX and, and even SDKs that are available. If you're bringing a legacy workload that you might not even be able to change some of the app components, um, just because they're, they're you know, already shipped and, and you don't have access to that code. Well, TDX is a way that you can bring your entire workload just in the VM. And again, take advantage of that same memory encryption with the hardware keys that are baked into the CPU. So all of the, all of the confidential computing solutions have that same underlying zero trust construct. Um, and of course, the ability to verify the environment with attestation. And that's, attestation is a really important part because Intel takes zero approach trust very seriously. So SGX and TDX are technologies that enable that, but the trustworthiness of TEE or the trusted execution environment really comes from that attestation capability. And what that means is you can, somebody else is telling you that this data is secure. And so really the, through attestation, the TEE can provide evidence or measurement of its origin and context, uh, current state. Both can be verified by another party, which is what makes it that much better. It could run in a cloud agnostic manner, you know, and Project Amber is a trust as a service from Intel, and that can be integrated with other services as well. Absolutely. 
And uh, to let you know, just uh, available now in Azure is a, a limited preview where you can sign up. We'll have a link at the end. We already have Intel TDX up and running in Azure and it already has built-in support for Project Amber for attestation. So you can choose between the attestation that Microsoft provides with our Microsoft Azure attestation or using Project Amber from Intel. So again, flexibility and choice for customers. That's always our mantra with uh, confidential computing offerings. Building on that, we talked about granular applications with SGX. We talked about overall VMs with Intel TDX. In the middle, there's the ability to isolate containers with this whole new cloud native push. A lot of customers are talking about, uh, to us about containers. In that regard, Intel and Microsoft are partnering within, again, an open source, uh, open ecosystem, uh, CNCF avenue with Kata containers. And there's a project called Kata Confidential Containers that we're mutually contributing towards. So in, in due time, as we get TDX, more pervasive in Azure, we'll equally work to get our container offerings there as well. Beautiful. And that's right, you know, because working in the open really benefits the entire uh, community and the customers. You can truly jointly participate, give your requirements early on, as opposed to getting it to be fully baked. Absolutely. If you're not familiar with Kata containers, it's, it's, it's simple. It's just creating subdivisions of your virtual machine to create VM isolation between your different containers. I think the beauty here is, you know, you get each container slash pod is hypervisor isolated, as secure as a VM and as fast as a container. So you really get the best of both worlds in this case. All right, so now we can think about fun technology that is available, where the future is going, what about right now? So if you, if you weren't aware, Intel SGX virtual machines are available in Azure in 17 different regions in GA. Those, those have been um, with us for a few years. And then with the new technology, Intel TDX, you can lift and shift your existing workloads. Uh, that's available in a, in a limited preview that you can sign up for uh, with the link on the screen. And I would say with OpenFL, it's a current initiative by Intel you know, in the Linux Foundation, it's available to you for use, you know, in production. Um, you can demo OpenFL and ACC, you know, Azure Container Service with Intel team here at Build, just around the corner, you know, at 428, where the Intel booth is. And for people who are online, check out the Intel showcase to see demos and videos, and we would love to engage with you. All right, let's get into some questions. Uh, reminder for those in the room, you have a QR code if you wanna go and submit questions. Anyone online, uh, I hope you're putting some questions in the chat. We can, we can uh, spend a few minutes here field, fielding any. Okay, the first question is, do you think this level of security will become more general purpose in the future? I, I would love to jump on this one. <laughs> uh, absolutely, so from the Azure perspective, we do see the future of computing being confidential computing. And then at that point, it's just computing again, right? So just like we saw transitions in other types of encryption mechanisms, like just think about the web. It was HTTP back in the 90s. Early 2000s, we started seeing credit card sites picking up HTTPS. So you knew, hey, don't put your credit card into a website unless it was encrypted. That's the stage where we are today with confidential computing. If I could flick a switch and have all of cloud and edge infrastructure instantly updated with these capabilities, that would be fantastic. Um, the reality is it's new hardware with some of these new encryption capabilities. So it does take time to roll out and become pervasive. So with that said, it's, it is that phase of, hey, are, is this like a, a website with credit card purchases? Well, those are the workloads, the very sensitive workloads that are either regulatory, healthcare, finance, public sector, those are a lot of the workloads that I see today. Uh, eventually over time, absolutely, this will just be the new de facto standard for compute in the, in the years to come. And the way I see this is that really, you know, you may not have to worry about it, but somebody will be worrying it on your behalf. So companies like Microsoft and Intel will continue to innovate so that in Azure, you have TDX, SGX, Grameen, whatever capabilities we come together, they're available to you and up-level for you so that you can just continue to say, I'm using HTTPS, yeah. 
yeah. because I know behind the scene is using the confidential computing layers and I'm golden. So as a developer, your concerns may not be you know, directly uh, relatable, but somebody will take care of it. That's always something that you can verify too, if it's meaningful for you or the customers and partners that you work with. Uh, next question. Is there any human review abuse detection RLHF that may be compromised, that may compromise data confidentiality? I'm not sure I know what RLHF means. I don't know too. Well, I think we can try, try to target the answer otherwise. I think the data confidentiality part, you know, would likely be more automated, in my opinion, because the attestation mechanism and all of those need to kind of stay in there. Where it might make more sense is, as the models are being generated, you know, how do you tag the model? How do you make sure the right metadata is being identified over there? That's where a human element would be there. Because in this case, you know, if you start putting human element in there, it's not gonna let you scale. It's not gonna let you be more seamless. You know, particularly if your model is running, say, in the um, pen case, 71 sites across six continents. If you have to start injecting home human into each process every time the model is coming back and forth, the whole idea here is use automation to your benefit and automate the heck out of it where it's just automated so much you have secured it and then make sure you're doing the regular auditing to ensure the confidentiality and the integrity. I definitely agree. The other aspect is really using attestation to your advantage. You can create policies that are, are very granular and uh, in these cases, especially where there's a model developer in one place who's protecting their IP and a data provider in another place who's protecting their data, each of them can attest to the environment and make sure, okay, I will not allow my code to run on this data until I know my code is protected or my model is protected. And equally, the data provider can do a policy that says, I, I want to make sure this data is not accessed by anyone without authorization. So you can keep very fine-grained controls through policies in your attestation as to who can actually access the data or the models at, the, at different points in time. Um, and obviously, only uh, unlocking everything once that mutual attestation is done within this secure environment. All right, there's a next question here. What AI do you recommend for public transit agencies? Boy, that's an interesting one. I don't, I don't know if I've talked to enough public transit agencies <laughs> to, to have a, a peer recommendation. It, it will come down to some of those same factors that we talked about before. This is almost every engagement that I, I get into with, with customers and partners. It's asking some of those questions. What is the data? What parts of the data are sensitive or, or what pieces of the data set need to be protected? Who do they need to be protected from and when? So as you're designing a solution that you're um, um, involving sensitive data that needs to be protected, you, you want to build the full end-to-end -end solution knowing when the data is actually unlocked and being processed. And then that's a place where you can consider what, what type of environment it should run in. If it should run in a confidential computing environment, great. There's multiple options on that spectrum. Do you need to protect against the person actually managing the infrastructure? Well, then you need a, a much tighter boundary on that data so that only certain code and only certain pieces are in your trust boundary. So, so there's lots of options to, to get into when you think about designing the solution. So that's when I, I could make some assumptions here on the fly, but without knowing the, yeah. the full <clears throat> gravity of what data and who it needs to be protected from, I think that's the, the basis. Right, and the way I think about this is like, what are we trying to solve here? Are we really trying to, say, minimize the route, like have a shortest route? Are we trying to optimize for gas? You know, are we trying to see how many passengers are sitting in a bus you know, and as they're going through different public transits? What are we trying to look for? What is the end goal here? Because once you put that end goal into perspective, then comes saying, okay, where is the data available? Is it available? Is it open data? Is it the jurisdiction element? So I think you start kind of collaborating that. Is it that, if a person has to go from, say, home to a city far away, oh, they are taking a bus, and now they are taking a train, and now they are going a ferry route. So then you will start collaborating with those different agencies. I think it really depends upon what are we trying to achieve, what is the jurisdiction, what is the data, what is available, and then really looking at working with the data scientists on that element. I'm going to fire this one at you. Can, can using OpenFL 
help keep my model secure? Absolutely. Well, I mean, as we talked about it, OpenFL is very deeply integrated with secure confidential computing. You know, the model, because in OpenFL case, you are really taking your model from your collaborator to, or rather, aggregator to the collaborator. And in that sense, you know, at rest, at, at motion, the model is secure. And if on the edge you are also running the SGX environment, this is all baked into OpenFL by default itself. So it will be able to leverage those primitives to keep not just your data, but your model secure as well. And that's a key point about that Intel SGX technology. By default, even the local administrator is blocked out from being able to access that data. So it's only the one who provides the policy and, and actually provides the solution. You could have a third party or even someone within your own company operating that infrastructure on-prem or in the cloud, and those uh, uh, tenant administrators are also obfuscated from being able to see any of that data. So it's truly innovative and, and, and remarkable technology to be able to leverage. Here's a question for you then. Uh, how do you see the future of the CCF and community working together to improve security? For, for me, I think the Confidential Consortium framework is, is fantastic as a, a mechanism that can be used for various solutions. Uh, I brought up a, a few different services that are built on some of that distributed trust. Um, I, I personally think a lot of logging and, and auditing will be based on uh, services that are, are powered with that type of distributed trust framework. Um, and in general, I, I put it into the conversation with confidential computing. Right? So all of these frameworks, all of these solutions that are built on top of that base infrastructure, those are all going to be working together. And uh, again, open source being a key theme of that, that mantra that says, can I understand the code? Can I audit the code that is going into some of these services and solutions? I think CCF is, is going to be uh, an integral part of that. Um, again, with the ability to attest and, and understand and measure the code that's in some of these services, it can be super, super powerful for, for what we need going forward. What you're telling me is this is an open invite for people to come join the Confidential Computing Consortium, participate yeah. and define what they would like to see over there. Yeah, and, and for sure, all of the organizations involved are, are very much welcome to not just the people that build solutions, but also the ones that consume them. Um, I, I think there's a, a, a higher opportunity for uh, end users and developers and customers to go and weigh in what some of those needs are. Even regulatory perspectives to say, hey, here's how the, regula the regulations on certain data sets come into play. I don't want to think that confidential computing is a, a replacement for regulation, right. right? It has to all be working together so that everything can be done to, to the letter of the law and confidential computing is a, is a tool in that toolbox to bring that defense in depth and actually uh, help protect data through its entire life cycle. Well, that's what geek friends do to geek friends. You know, you go tell your friends about joining Confidential Computing Consortium <laughs> and help out. Absolutely. Um, question, uh, do you have a GDPR or equivalent policies already defined? That, that taps into some of the regulations that we just brought up. Yeah. So there, there are different regulations worldwide. I would not pretend to be an expert in, in all the different worldwide country and, and local uh, regulations. But in general, the, the thing that we're trying to do is provide more transparency as well as that, f that further protection uh, to, to really put customers of, of Azure, from my perspective, in full control of their data at all times. And, and then every customer and company would, um, would likely need to do the assessment based on their local regulations on how confidential computing can be impactful. And really the key is whatever the new regulation is, in that sense, the Confidential Computing Consortium will work with that regulation and use le leverage the tool as something to work with your pro problem and create a solution. Hold on. I'm just looking at the time. I think we do have to wrap up here, so we don't, we don't have any more time for, for questions. I do want to thank everybody, both in person and online, for joining the session. Uh, anyone watching on demand, uh, thanks for tuning in as well. Um, this has been a fantastic build, being able to come back in person. So it was my pleasure to be here, and, and thanks very much for joining. Thank you very much. I am really excited that I completed my first build talk ever. So I'm really happy to be here. You can catch both of us outside in the hallway for further conversations.